All right, let's get into God's word. Uh, get your Bibles out, your pens, your, your notebooks. And we today are in Luke chapter 11. Uh, I'm in Luke chapter 11, 1 to 13. I would, it would do us well for me to read the whole passage and then let's go over it again. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when, when you pray, say, Father, hall uh, Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive one another who are indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. He will answer from within. Don't bother me. The door is now shut. My children are sleeping in bed with me. I cannot, get, I cannot get up and go give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because, of his, because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. To the one who knocks, it will be open. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead... Uh, of a fish, give him a serpent. And if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Just a quick devotional uh, exposition of this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful passage. This passage is about the Lord's Prayer, but it's not only about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the, 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 the weight of this passage is found in the very first line. If you look at the very first line, now Jesus was praying. Now Jesus was praying. <laughs> that is, I mean, just stop and think about that. Jesus is God. So Jesus was talking to God the Father. And that's communication at the highest level. Intimacy at the highest level. Now Jesus was praying and he was in a particular place and they say certain because he would go there to pray. Those, there were so, so, sorted places for him to pray. And when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, and here's another key thing you want to note. Lord, teach us to pray. And most people, Sunday school teachers, uh, you know, theologians, everyone stops there. And disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, Teach us to pray. No, that, that's not what, that's not, that's not even the full sentence. Look at what he says. Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Yet that? As John taught his disciples. Who's John? John the Baptist. So what's happening here is a new movement, a new perspective, a new understanding of prayer. Come on. These are Jews. They know how to pray. They've been taught how to pray from the, from the day they were born. At the age of, by the age of 13, the Old Testament was wrapped around their, their uh, wrists and their necks and their everywhere, foreheads. By 13, they knew the Old Testament and the Pentateuch by heart. These are Jews. They know how to pray. So they didn't come to Jesus and say, please, please teach us to pray. He, they said, John taught his disciples to pray in a particular way. Something has changed in heaven. Something has changed in the dynamic in which we approach God. Something has changed in the way God listens to people. Something is not the same. We don't have to go into the temple anymore. We don't have to have the uh, priest take a sacrifice alongside the prayer. We don't have to have representation, mediation on our behalf in prayer. Something is different. Was John correct in what he was teaching his disciples? Jesus, what do you have to say? Can you teach us the way John taught his disciples to pray? So that's the radicality of this prayer. So when he starts, our father in heaven, he is radically altering the basis upon which people would come to God in prayer. Till that point, God was not as father because you're not his son. Jesus said to Nicodemus, if you want to be saved, you need to be born again. John chapter 3, you need to be born again. 
you must be born again. You're born of flesh, but you need to be born of water and the spirit. Those who are born are born of the flesh that is from earth, but you need to be born from above, born of God. You are not all are the creation of God, but all are not the children of God. If you are a child of God, you need to be born of God. You need to have the seed of God in you. You need to have the nature of God in you. You have to have the character of God in you. You need to have the person of God in you. You are born of God. This is a supernatural, miraculous, regenerative work that only God does. A baby doesn't get born of its own will. A baby is born by the desire of his father and, and mother. So he says, to Nicodemus, you must be born again. So just saying God as father was a radical alteration in the mind of the Jew himself. So right there, they would have stopped and said, hold on, what? Father, hallowed be thy name. Our father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then you know the, you know the prayer and it's not even fully quoted because that's not the point of the passage. The point of the passage is not to give you one prayer to pray in the morning of the beginning of the day and the end of the day. This is not that. He was saying, this is how you come to God. And then he gives you two examples to nail his point, his thesis, nail his, his premise as to why he says you need to pray like this. So you already know, Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day a daily bread. Forgive us. You see how, how, how uh, summarized, succinct it is here in the Luke version. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation. Boom, done. Then he goes to verse five and verse five to verse 13 is what is, 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 uh, is poignant for, for us because it helps us understand where Jesus was coming from with regard to taking prayer to the next level. He says in verse five, he says, which of you who has a friend? Okay, which of you who has a friend? So we talked about father and now we're talking about a friend. Which of you has a friend? Uh, we'll go to him in the middle of the night. So what? So let me tell you the story. So you have a friend and some relatives from Bhatinda show up in the middle of the night, okay? They rock up, you know, the train was late. You picked them up 12.30, one o'clock in the morning. They are home, they are hungry. You don't have anything to eat. The, 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 the shop in, across the street is closed. So you go knock on your friend's door. What's the basis of your knocking on the friend's door? He is your friend. He's not just your neighbor, he's your friend. So you have a certain confidence that no matter what the situation is, it being one o'clock in the morning, two in the morning, he will still wake up and help you. You have a confidence that he will understand your predicament. You have a confidence that he will understand and share your desire to give your guests food. You get where I'm going with this? You have, you have a confidence that the mental uh, mentality will be the same. The mindset will be the same. Somebody who shares your mindset okay so you knock on a friend's door not any random uh, uh, neighbor's door you knock on a friend's door and he says because of his impudence another word or another version says because of his persistence because he's persistent he says number one you're he's persistent you're persistent and number two he's your friend okay number one he's persist you are persistent and number two he is your friend because of these two things he will get up and he will get you the bread and he'll say, here, go feed your guests. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying that there is a relationship and there is persistence. There is a relationship and there is persistence. Based on that, your need and desire to give will be met by his willingness to help you give. Then he says in verse 8, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, Yet because his impudence, he will rise. So if, even if his friendship doesn't take him there, his impudence will. Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Okay, here's the big verse in verse 9. I tell you, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and it shall find, you shall find. Knock and it will be open to you. You know this verse. You've heard it so many times. Ask, seek knock they're progressive they're progressive it's almost opposite actually because first you need to knock and then you need to seek and then you need to ask but then he's got that back to front and he says ask seek and knock so it depends on on on, on your situation i suppose but here's that incredible verse and what i'm 
pointing out to you this morning is that this is the context within which this verse is given to you. The asking, the seeking, the knocking is in the context of prayer, okay? And the prayer is in the context of the relationship you do have with God the Father. Okay, for everyone who asks, receives, he who seeks, finds, and to whom knocks, it will be opened. It will be opened. Okay, now, next example, verse 11. So, first one was, what friend among you, right? Second one is, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of the fish give him a serpent, a snake? Yeah. What kind of a father does that? Would a father do that? Would any kind of a father do that? Your son is asking for fish, you give him a serpent. Your son is asking for uh, scrambled eggs, you give him a scorpion. Which father does that? And the rhetoric? Of course not. If you then, if you then, if you then, who are you? You are nobody. Who are you? You are human. Who are you? You are broken. You are evil. You are under forgiveness. You are under God's mercy. If you can give your children good gifts, if you can think about the gifts, if you can sacrifice and give good gifts, what's the premise here? And if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Okay. Everything is very common here. It's simple. It's what you see. So there's no hidden messages here, but we want to bring it out on the table and look at it. If you then know, you know how to give good gifts. Won't God the Father know how to give good gifts? And if you did ask him, will he not give? And if you ask him, will he not give the Holy Spirit? Hello, hang on a minute. I didn't ask for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I asked for eggs. I asked for eggs. I asked for fish. But you ask your earthly father for eggs and fish. But what do you ask the heavenly father for? What would you ask a spiritual father for? What would you ask the heavenly father for? And the heavenly father will give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is God. So when you ask God for anything, he gives you himself. He is the provision. He himself is the provision. So he comes with you. He is in you. Now, why, why are we talking about this? Because we want to understand the two intense truths that Jesus wants you to believe in as you come to him in prayer. Two intense truths. Number one, you are friends with God, not enemies. You are friends with God. At any given time, you can share the same mindset that God shares because you know his will and he knows your desires. Friend, friend. Number two, he's a father who knows how to give good gifts. When you, an evil uh, or, or, or a human or a sinful father, know how to give good gifts, how much more the heavenly father? Number one, he has the same mindset as you. Number two, he has the same desire for you. When you come to God in prayer, you come to God based on, if you're writing this down, who God is. You come to God based on who God is. Hey, he's my friend. He understands me. He knows me. He, he's my God. He's my friend. He, he, who God is. Number two, when you come to God, you come to God based on who you are to God. Who you are to God. Prayer is not the outcome of our performance. Prayer is not the outcome of our uh, sinfulness or lack of sinfulness or holiness or anything of the sort. We come to God because he's our father. We come to God because we are his children and he knows us and understands us. And when we ask him, he doesn't just give us stuff and send us off. He gives us himself. He gives us the Holy Spirit to be with us. Who is God? He owns everything. He owns everything. You work in a school, he owns your school. You have a bank balance, he owns the bank. You have a debt, he owns the entire credit system. 
You have an uncertain future. He knows everything about the future. So he doesn't give you answers. He doesn't give you solutions. He doesn't give you uh, handouts. He comes to you himself. You have the Holy Spirit. People don't pray. People don't understand prayer because they don't understand the purpose for prayer. The purpose for prayer is fellowship of God with me. The purpose of prayer is for the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in me. I ask God for the spirit of God so that he can be in me so that we can do life together. Once I have him on my team, in my car, in my house, with me for life, once I'm partnered, once I'm married to him, I'm not going to worry about the details. You see that? I'm not going to worry about the details. I'm not going to be bothered about how am I going to work out this? How is that going to happen? When we land, what happens? When we leave, what happens? God will take care of it. As long as he's with me, God will take care of it. <clears throat> so now prayer is not about the provision. Prayer is about his presence. Prayer is not about his provision, but it's, it's about his presence. If you ask him, how much more will the heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit? So God doesn't give you things. God gives you his presence. And with his presence comes everything that he owns, which is everything. Many of us don't pray earnestly, persistently, because you are counting your own sin. You're counting your own uh, uh, unfaithfulness. You are looking at your own weakness. And you're seeing yourself in the, in the mire of your own brokenness. My brother and sister, God doesn't see you like that. So you're wasting your time. Jesus doesn't see you like that. So you're wasting your time. You, the only reason why your prayer is being heard is because you are a child of God, which means you have been born from above. And if you've been born from above, you're a child of God. If you're a child of God, heaven is your home. And when you pray, you are essentially going home. You are essentially reaching out to dad. You're essentially expecting everything you expect dad to give. So he says, and if you dads can give your children the very best, I will give you more. I will give you more. This morning, God wants to assure each and every one of you that there are prayer matters that you haven't even thought about that he's thought about answering. And he's all, all he's waiting for you to do is ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Knock, seek, ask. He's waiting for you to understand your position in heaven, your permanence in this relationship with him, your priority in his heart. He's waiting to see, waiting for you to understand that you all you need to do is ask. Not on the basis of your performance, but on the basis of your, the permanency of your relationship with him. Say you have a friend and you go to him at two in the morning. Even if he says he doesn't want to come out, even if he's your friend, because of your persistence, he will come through for you. Will God not do much more? Your son asks you for a, for a, 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 a fish. Would you give him a serpent? Your son asks you for eggs. Would you give him a scorpion? Of course you wouldn't. And if you can think of great gifts to give you, wouldn't God give much, much greater? In fact, he'd give you the very best of himself. Himself. He'd give you everything, including himself. He won't hold back anything. That, my friends, once we understand, should, should make us throng the throne of God. It should make us just absolutely storm the, the, the throne room of God. We should be naggers of God, not our family. We should absolutely let him have it. We should not spare anything. He says, pray about everything. Let your supplication be known to God. Let every single smallest to the greatest of details be known to God. And show to God by your prayer that you want him on your side, that you want him to provide, that you want it from him, that you will not do without him, that you are depending on him, and that outside of him you have nothing. Show him that you are not someone who wants to do it on your own. You will manage on your own. God helps those who help themselves. Rubbish. 
That's not even in the concordance. Forget about the Bible. God doesn't help those who help themselves. God leaves those who help themselves to help themselves. God helps those who come to him understanding that he's there for them. And their need, and, and the basis of that prayer is the relationship. Now let me end with this. The basis of your, of the, of your prayer confidence is who you are to Christ. Number one, who is God and who you are to God. The basis, the basis. And the basis is that you are born of God. If you are born of God, you are royalty. You are blood-bought citizens of heaven. You are children of God. You have greater rights in heaven than angels do. And if you had done that, it was because Jesus shed his blood for you and died for you. It is because Christ went to the cross for you. So two things I want to remind you. You are you are boss in heaven under God, of course. But at, in heaven, you, you walk the streets like you own the place. But never forget that Jesus put you there. Jesus put you there. It cost him his life to put you there. And then God the Father says, if you ask me, will I not even give you myself? So I give you myself, I give you Jesus, and I give you the Holy Spirit. What's left? Green card. Come on. You see what I'm saying? We need to be audacious, you know, naggers of the throne of God. We need to get the angels to look at each other and like, oh, not him again. We need to really change, change our perspective and understanding of things. So, so the disciples come to Jesus and they say to Jesus, Teach us how to pray the way John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. So what did Jesus teach him? He didn't teach them the words of prayer. He taught them the worth of prayer. He taught them why you need to pray. And who you are to pray. Not just who God is, but who you are. And I'm telling you this, this Sunday morning. Your prayer life will never be the same once you realize who you are to God. And once you figure that out, you'll be as audacious as a son in his master's house, in his father's house. Two questions. Who is God? And number two, who are you to God? And that will radically alter your prayer life. Never look at the Lord's prayer ever the same again. Never look at the Lord's Prayer ever the same again. He didn't give it to you for the words. He didn't give it to you for, for an understanding of how, you know, God takes care of all our needs and forgiveness. All that is true. But when you look deeper, you find greater things. You find God saying, I'm ready to give you myself. Everything else is nothing. I can easily give you that. Thank you, Father God, for your, for your son. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your father's heart. I thank you, Lord, that you could have presented yourself to us in every possible mighty way. As king, as sovereign, you could have presented yourself as, 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 as Lord of the universe, creator of the universe. For every title, we would have had no choice but to bow our knee. But you presented, us to, presented yourself to us as a father. And that assumes, Lord, that we are your sons, that we have rights. And only your son could have made that happen. I thank you so much for Jesus. I thank you for the prayer. I thank you for the platform of prayer. I thank you for the purpose of prayer. And I pray, Lord, that our prayer lives would radically be altered, changed, ignited to a greater level, even as the time comes closer for your return. Lord, may we know who, you, who we are in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.